Thank you. Thank you for this uh, invitation. Uh, it's a great pleasure and an honor to be here. Uh, thank you for the organizers and uh, this wonderful uh, site, uh, which is hosting this uh, very interesting conference. So I'm uh, delighted to be here. So um, I'd like to take a look back and um, at the very broad level, have some reflections on um, my, my diasporas, um, most notably the Jewish one, which is going to be the, my most, uh, which is going to be my focus, but also uh, the Armenian one, and really talk initially about some conceptual frameworks that we have been working with when we look at the histories of Jews and Armenians and Greeks, the classic millets of the Ottoman Empire, and to really reflect a little bit and exchange ideas about those. Um, because obviously uh, there have been many concepts that we have inherited from historiography. There's been a lot of work done on these concepts, but we still live within the legacy of certain presuppositions and that it would be time to take a look uh, and, uh, and, and, and I'd like to share with you my, my reflections. Um, before I go into that, um, I, I'd like to uh, start specifically with the um, arrival of the Jews, quote unquote, arrival uh, in 1492, which has occupied a huge uh, space in uh, the historiography uh, when we uh, look back at these particular uh, groupings. There is almost always the assumption that 1492 is the moment of uh, the beginning of the Jewish diaspora in the Ottoman Empire. In a cursory kind of way, there's a mention that is made of uh, other Jews that may have existed in uh, what used to be the Byzantine Empire and, the, and then sort of replaced by the Ottoman Empire, most notably the Romaniot Jews, the Greek-speaking Jews. But nevertheless, what is really striking about this is that um, they almost always have disappeared in the way that we have looked into this particular history. Uh, even though, for example, in Istanbul, they are the majority really until the end of the 17th century. And of course, in places like Yanina, of course, they will continue until uh, the 20th century. And apart from that, um, um, there are, um, uh, of course, uh, migrations, especially from Europe, that had already started in the 14th century from Germany, from France, that arrived in Ottoman lands, and a constant coming and going uh, of, of ve from various sites, north and south, uh, uh, to uh, Ottoman lands. So even though our focus is being dominated by 1492, I think it's time to open that up a lot more uh, and there has been a, a very perverse inheritance of the notion that the arrival of the Jews in 1492, but not Sephardi Jews specifically, but the Jews, has given to the impression, especially in, uh, in, um, uh, in perceptions that are uh, negative towards Jews, that these are newcomers, even though they are newcomers so for five centuries or four centuries, um, therefore, they, that uh, what is very specific, and I note this in Turkish historiography, but also in other historiography as well, uh, that um, this these Jewish communities are really guests in these lands, uh, and which I think has had a, a very um, deleterious effect in terms of our understanding the complexities of the Jewish communities. And I do think that it's very important for us, especially in the early modern period, but even later, to be aware of the multiple layers of uh, Jewish groups in the Ottoman Empire, Italian Jews, Ashkenazi Jews, Sephardic Jews, uh, uh, Romaniot Jews, um, Arab Jews, and a whole host of them that eventually, of course, it's true, will become, broadly speaking, with the vast majority, Sephardi, because eventually they will assimilate 
uh, into the Sephardi culture. But I just want to start when we look at the Jew Jewish diaspora to open up this con concept and move away from a kind of a more monolithic group that people uh, seem to operate under. And especially to really let us focus on the fact that this notion of late arrival has in the, um, in the 20th century has had very negative implications uh, when we look at this particular history. I'd also like to take a, 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 a moment to speak of the language of the Jews, Ladino or Judeo-Spanish, uh, which is very frequently assumed to have been brought over intact from Spain in a kind of transplanted manner, while uh, obviously the language was indeed brought by the emigres from the Iberian Peninsula, it really emerges as an Ottoman language in the Ottoman Empire. It is not transplanted medieval Spanish. It is a kind of koine that is brought, made together by multiple linguistic influences that emerges in the Ottoman Empire, and therefore it is very much an Ottoman uh, language. So when we look at this jury, which becomes Sephardi, is not really initially Sephardi, um, we of course almost immediately think of it as a classical millet in the famous millet system that has so much has been written uh, about the millet system and lots of revisions have been made to the very notion of the millet and yet still we uh, live with uh, the notion of the millet and I think there is certainly some uh, good reasons why that word really uh, persists and the concept persists but I do think it also obscures a lot uh, that um, uh, that uh, needs to be stated. Millet almost always leads to the notion of a mosaic. That is to say, there's this millet, the Greek millet, the Armenian millet, the Jewish millet, and then the Turks or the Muslims and the Greeks and, the, you know, this whole kind of notion of separate groups, which also sometimes hides the degree of porousness of the boundaries between these groups. And uh, there are, especially in the urban context, uh, profound cultural, economic, ex and social exchanges between all of these groups in food ways, in dress, in music. Uh, all of these groups, in fact, become Ottoman in their culture and in their context, are deeply embedded in the Ottoman social fabric. Uh, to a degree where, where this notion of millets uh, uh, very frequently thought of as separate entities has had a tendency to hide. Now it's much harder, and in fact the focus, I think there's a whole area of historiography left to explore, to really study the exchanges between these groups in a more uh, 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 in a more thorough way. And here I think uh, uh, certainly uh, the work that needs to be done uh, will be done by scholars who uh, have to collaborate because the number of languages that any one person will be obliged to master to do this scholarship is really too 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 many to enumerate here. Um, and that therefore uh, I salute this uh, conference for even bringing together two groups as the object of study here. But I do think that uh, we do need to really understand a lot more. Uh, the way that communities uh, saw each other, interacted, uh, and, and, and lived uh, together. Um, so the millet system, I'd like to take it a little bit back uh, in terms of reflections and also uh, reflect on, 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 on a way of approaching this that I, I have worked a little bit on this before. I'd like to take a look back because under the millet system, as we look at it, which is very frequently not a real system, but yes, a system of sorts, we also have the notion, the famous notion of Ottoman toleration, right? There's the millets, millets are autonomous, supposedly, they run their affairs, internal affairs, and, and then the Ottoman Empire, uh, the Ottoman ruling uh, elite or the rulers 
tolerate these minorities and therefore there is a coexistence toleration and coexistence have emerged as fundamental tropes in historiography when we deal with uh with with this concept and i think that there is certainly a lot to be said for the notion that the system that as it existed did allow these groups uh, to run a large part of their affairs, although there are limits to that, um, and uh, that they were tolerated, which however in English and in French have two dimensions tolerated in a positive sense, but tolerated, which we only need to put the word barely uh, to, uh, to reach to the negative. Well, I'm not suggesting they were barely tolerated, but toleration can also have a negative uh, uh, impact so that I do think it's important for us to be aware when we're using this concept of toleration uh, of uh, the limits of this concept. In, indeed, um, it, it would be interesting to even to talk within this context a little bit to think about coexistence. What does coexistence really mean? Coexistence means people living together, vivre ensemble in French. Um, but obviously, People have lived together for, for a long time. The question that we need to ask is when they don't live together. In some ways, I think one of the ways to look at this is not be surprised at coexistence, but to take it as a default position and to really uh, study moments in history when this breaks down. And this is true in Europe, in uh, any parts of the world, as well as in the Ottoman Empire. So coexistence is, um, is, is something that really needs to be um, uh, also un unpacked in this way. Um, and in some ways, I hear I'd like to use the anthropologist Robert Hayden's words about that is really about antagonistic coexistence. That is to say, a limit to coexistence, coexistence based on the imbalance of power. Uh, the power manages coexistence, uh, uh, manages the negotiation of difference. But nevertheless, built into the scheme is a hierarchical power relationship with clear lines that should not be crossed. So in that respect, toleration has its limits and has to be thought on this way. Uh, so difference that is often antagonistic as well as harmonious is built into this overall context, context of um, uh, of uh, antagonistic tolerance. Uh, this, by the way, will work well when there is one dominant group. And when its hegemony is challenged or in danger, uh, this whole framework of coexistence slash toleration disappears and is indeed very frequently replaced by ethnic cleansing. This indeed explains very well uh, the Ottoman situation at the end of the empire, but even earlier with frequent bouts of violence that will interrupt the long saga of coexistence. So there are always moments of violence built into this, what is useful to think of as an antagonistic tolerance. I think it's important for, I'm just throwing these out for exchange of ideas. It's important for us to think through some of these categories by which we have looked at, especially the early modern period in the Ottoman Empire um, that has affected diaspor diasporic groups like the Armenians and the Jews and the Greeks and all other non-Muslim uh, groups in the Ottoman Empire. So this is a kind of an ideal typical sort of images of, of, uh, of, uh, of the um, uh, the place that was occupied by these non-Muslim millets as we entered the modern period. And of course, the entrance into the modern period is going to bring together profound changes into this uh, structure and indeed to profound ruptures and the breakdown of this arrangement. Um, most notably, uh, uh, we could talk a little bit about the Tanzimat reforms, the reforms by the Ottoman Empire, 
in, in trying to centralize more, to bring new kinds of administrative uh, administrations, new types of law uh, under very much European domination of the region uh, with dominant economic power of Europe that will have uh, profound changes uh, in, uh, in the long term uh, uh, in the Ottoman Empire. There is some very interesting work that has been done, especially in the Armenian context that I'm familiar with, um, uh, about the transformation as a result of Tanzimat reforms of the internal administration and eventually the kind of remaking of communities and provinces in different ways, the rupture with old alliances, with local groups, and, and then eventually the state uh, changing uh, its relationship with the Armenian uh, 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 groups, uh, the way that it operated until uh, on the Tanzimat period to profound new ways, which of course now with the benefit of hindsight, we know were extremely problematic as we go into the end of the 19th century. But just to show that so this is I'm giving this as a case study uh, uh, to to show that some of the changes that are happening uh, as a result of what has been called in an earlier historiography westernization or westernizing reforms uh, or new kind of now centralizing reforms on the Tanzimat are going to have uh, unforeseen consequences for all the non-Muslim groups. Um, I think also a major source of dislocation, which we need to study even more than has been done already, is the uh, way that European economic domination altered fundamentally the power imbalance and forces in the 19th century uh, and, uh, um, and will lead to dramatic changes. And I'm not even talking about the rise of nationalism uh, the rise of the Greek nation state, for example, the breakdown of the uh, Balkans uh, into uh, uh, different uh, national uh, nation states, starting with Serbia and then Greece and then, of course, Bulgaria, uh, that will mark the long 19th century, the 19th century in this respect. Um, we have also the rise of major port cities like Izmir. Uh, and Salonika and Istanbul and Alexandria uh, that will uh, lead to very different kinds of uh, socioeconomic relations uh, with European settlements, as well as uh, a richer upper class emerging, uh, a kind of a bourgeoisie of sorts that emerges uh, among Armenians, Jews, uh, and, and the Greeks in the famous Eshel, of the, of, the, of the 19th century in these port cities. When it comes to the Jewish context uh, here, I want briefly to mention uh, something uh, 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 that I worked on for a long time. Of course, it's the major work of the Alliance Israelite Universelle, uh, which is a French Jewish organization that was created in 1860 that eventually created a vast network of schools. Uh, in uh, around the Mediterranean uh, and actually as far east as Iran. Uh, suffice it to say that as a result of this schooling system, which became the default school system uh, among the Jews, and here is what marks the Jews compared to Armenians and, and Greeks, that there is indeed one unitary cultural influence and that is French that marks the Jews much more so than any other group with the exception of Maronites uh, in, in Lebanon marks the Jews uh, where the French uh, becomes the lingua franca among Jews and becomes in uh, uh, the francophonie that is established among Jews uh, uh, becomes in some ways almost a Jewish ethnic marker of sorts itself. That is to say, in a kind of odd sort of way, it's not necessarily the Jews are assimilating to French, but it's co-opting French into uh, the remaking of a modern ethnicity where speaking French in an in in a kind of um, in a in a setting of uh, bourgeois or uh, higher culture or even lower down 
is going to become a marker of modern Jewish Sephardi uh, ethnicity it itself. Um, and friendship will have also a huge impact on Ladino with hundreds, if not thousands of loan words that will get Judeo-Hispanicized in a way that mir mirrors the way French is a Judeo-Hispanicized and becomes this kind of marker and Ladino reaches a different, um, a different uh, sort of stage in its development through the, um, um, through, through French. Um, by the way, it's kind of really fascinating for anybody who studies the Ladino press from uh, 1860s on, there's a huge press that I've, I've and other scholars have used. Uh, and what you see is initially lots and lots of Turkish words, sometimes Greek words, other, other words from other languages. Uh, and then all of a sudden by 1880s, the arrival of French words that are in judeo spanish and the old words being put in brackets and then by 1890s to the first decade of the 20th century, the brackets have disappeared, those words have disappeared, and French has become, the Judeo-Hispanicized French has become. I think that in this day of digital humanities, it would be interesting to count the number of brackets and do, do a study of that. I think it may be some very interesting uh, results. So um, I think that here, um, I think what is really very interesting in the Jewish context, which is perhaps different than the Armenian one uh, uh, or the Greek one, is the rapid um, um, absorption of French in some way in the Ottoman context leads to the cultural orientation of the Jews away from the locality towards France and uh, Europe in general in a much more radical way uh, than, uh, uh, than other groups, although that of course is, uh, is taking place in, among other groups as well. But there is a sense in which, um, I, and this merits a whole other uh, presentation and discussion, uh, there is a way in which um, Jews become um, uh, become oriented towards outside and associated with the foreign uh, in this kind of respect. That is to say, a way in which there is a divergence from the locality. Whereas in the, the trend that I started with earlier was the Jews and Armenians and Greek, this is all Ottoman and they rapidly, the Sephardim themselves become assimilated into an Ottoman context. In the late 19th century, we have the Jews in some ways moving away from that and becoming somewhat different so that they are associated, and this will have impact much later on, with the outside and therefore somehow becoming foreign. That is to say, especially in among groups that will be opposed to Jews. And that is one of the unforeseen uh, consequences of um, the way that uh, this divergence uh, began to take a place. Um, now, when we put all this, these changes, and I rapidly kind of uh, talked about them uh, with the, uh, uh, you know, in a, this uh, kind of quick overview, uh, where we have tolerance, but antagonistic tolerance and coexistence. But we have major socioeconomic, political uh, transformations, cultural transformations that will affect indeed all the groups, Armenians, Jews, Greeks, Turks, in, in this particular area with ruptures from the old arrangement and with the rise of the dominant model of the nation state, again, being important from the West, being adopted in an imperial context by the end of the 19th century, and eventually, of course, leading to the end of the empire, means that, um, in, in fact, uh, what we have is huge shocks to the system as we move in the 19th century. The Ottoman Empire, of course, is uh, very much interested in saving the empire, which are the Turkish words that are used in the uh, in the first decade of the 19th century, uh, uh, of the 20th century, sorry. Um, and uh, they, uh, the, the empire 
has to be saved and among the various ways in which the empire has to be saved are some nationalizing policies and uh, of course under wartime conditions uh, all kinds of much more drastic measures that are taking place but it is important to perhaps puncture uh, to 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 show the the the, the moment of the undoing of this uh, toleration where the antagonistic part then becomes predominant. Um, very interesting in early 1940, 1914, a Turkish official writing in Edirne, Adrianople, Andrinov, um, uh, where there is a mini exchange of population with Bulgarians, foreshadowing the population exchange Ten year, eight years later, but also the tra mass uh, transportation and death and 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 genocide of the Armenians, um, uh, where the words are very boldly stated. The imp there is now the impossibility of living together. The words are even put in a bureaucrat's setting at the time of population uh, exchange, which I think is uh, really um, kind of really pinpoints the moment of this breakdown at, uh, at the end uh, and um, the end of this whole paradigm of toleration and coexistence uh, that had taken over a century to unravel. What we now then have, have therefore for all of these uh, uh, diasporic groups uh, who then find themselves in new nation states, when, which will come out of the uh, breakdown of the Ottoman Empire, uh, they will become uh, from millets, they will become minorities. Uh, it is, and I'd like to end with this, um, uh, with this concept, I think we need to stop the usage of the term minority in the imperial context. Minority is not really appropriate to talk about uh, a situation in the imperial context where demographics did not have the same political meaning that it will come to in under the nation state. It is the nation state that fabricates minorities in when it comes into being um, in the political sense uh, of a very important uh, kind of uh, uh, in, in its 20th century meaning. Um, so from diasporic millets to minorities is the long arc uh, of the transition from toleration to the impossibility of living together. Thank you.